Well, we're going to this launch of research integrity and interior statistical analysis planning resource that we have. My name is Sean Lacey. I'm the research integrity and compliance officer for the university. And I'm joined here today by Dr. Darren Daly from the University of College Cork. On my left here, those online can't see him yet, but you will soon. And Dr. Vincent Cregan as well uh, from the Department of Mathematics in Munster Technological University. Um, and you're mainly here to uh, listen to Darren and uh, Vincent. So I'm just going to keep it very short to what I have to say and then hand over to, uh, to both of them. So just to kind of say, look, what, what is bringing us together here in terms of research integrity and statistical analysis planning? Like, why do we actually have it together? So in the, I suppose, when it comes to research integrity, we're very much informed in the university by our research integrity policy, nationally by the National Policy Statement on Ensuring Research Integrity in Ireland, and internationally by the European Code on Research Integrity. When we think of, I suppose, the principles of research integrity, the things we want to do and the things to avoid, they're all quite straightforward to uh, follow as long as we have plans in place. And today we're here to talk about statistical analysis planning. And I suppose when we look at that, then what, what this very much speaks to is the idea that when we have our, re our research results, when we have the results, we don't hold back on results that may not support our hypothesis. We don't look at... Uh, turning our data upside down, left and right, to try to find statistical significance, which would be the idea of p-hacking. We don't look at uh, defining our hypothesis after our results are known, which are, excuse me, which would be called hacking. And equally, when we have our results, we don't look at slicing and dicing them so many different ways, so we get multiple papers out of this, which we call uh, salami slicing. So this, that's all very much about don'ts and things like that, you know, and I suppose when it's not all about all oh, compliance and everything like that, and to be avoiding these things, I suppose, when I looked at starting as in the research integrity and compliance role back you know, over two and a half years ago, David would have, or the head of uh, School of Science and Mathematics would have said, compliance, we want it to be automatic, not enforced. And how we do that is by training and support. And that's essentially why we have this event here today, launching the results, uh, and sorry, launching this resource as a, a showing the supports that we have available in the university when it comes to statistical analysis planning which will be led by Dr. Vincent Cregan. But before handing over to Vincent, we have Dr. Darren Daly from the University College uh, Cork, who's going to speak to us on, I'm not too sure what he's going to speak to us, I'm slightly apprehensive, <laughs> but maybe just introduce Darren. So Darren is no stranger to us in, uh, in the, on the Cork campuses. He has come to speak to us on reproducible methods when it comes to statistical analysis in the past, on research integrity in the past as well. But maybe just to say that uh, Darren is the principal statistician for the HRB, Clinical Research Facility in UCC. He's a senior lecturer in, in research methodology uh, in the UCC School of Public Health. Is that correct? That? Yeah, perfect. And he also teaches postgrads. He teaches them as uh, clinical trial uh, study design and analysis, reproducible research methods, along with critical appraisal skills as well. But today, Darren is going to be here to speak to us about something. We'll find out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much for that, John. Uh, and thank you very much for the invite. So Sean and I, uh, we're also on the, the Clinical Trials and National Research Ethics Committee, uh, and we're on the same uh, clinical trial panel um, for all that. And so, uh, yeah, so Sean reached out, and, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, I need a title. Uh, and, and I was kind of late getting back to him with the title. And the only thing I had in my mind was like, whatever the title is going to be, it can't have to do anything with p-values. <laughs> and, th and then I see this popped up on LinkedIn, <laughs> and it was my take on the p-value debate, and my heart uh, just sank out of my chest. Because uh, I'm, uh, obviously I'm ha very happy to talk about p-values to some degree, but what I know about p-values, the thing I know the most about p-values is everybody hates p-values. Uh, and, and by extension, what I've learned as a statistician or someone who calls themselves a statistician is that everybody hates statistics. Uh, any statisticians in the room? Anyone willing to call themselves a statistician? I'm an epidemiologist by training. And maybe you, you could back me up on this when you say I'm a statistician and about a half the time, oh, I hated statistics in school, right? This is always the thing that comes back to me over and over and over again. Uh, and in fairness, as statisticians, we've, we've, I think we've earned that reputation. And this talk is going to be a little bit about why do we hate statistics and why do we hate p-values? Uh, we'll talk about some misconceptions about p-values, and then I'm, hopefully I'm going to end on some uh, kind of deeper level issues related to all the other stuff I'll talk about with statistics and how they tie into research integrity and everything. Else. Um, in terms of why we hate p-values or maybe why we hate statistics, not anybody here, of course. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. Maybe, maybe it's just people I happen to run into. I've got some kind of a selection bias. 
One thing is for sure that the p-value is something that is ubiquitously used in most areas of science, right? If you're doing any kind of quantitative science, if you're doing any kind of measurement, we're always going to want to say something about the uncertainty of measurements, and p-values are a tool for doing that. And so you open up any scientific paper, and you will see p-value and p-value and p-value and p-value. So there's no doubt that we use them an awful, awful lot. But what we also know is if we ask people what a p-value is, how it should be used, how it's defined, and all the rest of it, experts and amateurs alike get these questions wrong very, very frequently. So this is a survey. This goes back to 2002 and fairly well known kind of among statisticians who are interested in how to teach statistics. And you give people these little types of quizzes and you say, what are these things? And don't worry, everybody relax. Nobody's going to be asked to actually take this and give an answer. So just, just breathe deeply. And so what we learn over and over again is that if you're a student, if you're a professor, and alas, even if you're a statistician, people will get these wrong uh, quite, quite often which is really a, a disconnect with how we, how often we use p-values. And now about p-values and statistics and, and, and kind of philosophies, we might come back to some of that. Um, the debate about p-values and how they should be used and what they are and all the rest of it goes back, you know, well over 200 years. Um, really vicious debates in the early 20th century about them. And all of that kind of discussion about p-values and statistics and inference more generally really started coming to a head about 10, 15 years ago. And for some reason, it was the p-value that caught people's attention in the scientific press um, that maybe there was something wrong with p-values. And we started seeing articles like this um, questioning like this ubiquitous statistical tool that we all use, but clearly we're all using wrongly and clearly few of us really understand is this starting to produce a threat to science and the conclusions that we're making, right? Every one of those papers has a lot of p-values. It ends with some kind of a conclusion. Some of those conclusions are useful for, you know, for, for policymakers. And if the p-values somewhere in the middle are flawed or problematic, then our conclusions are problematic. And so a lot of attention started to come to this issue of the p-value. Probably the most kind of stark example of this at the time was 2015, a major journal in psychology banned p-values. All of a sudden, they made it an editorial policy that they would not report p-values in the papers that they were publishing. And you can go and you can Google this or whatever. It didn't end well, to say, to say the least. They didn't really have anything to replace the p-value, right? So it was, we're going to get rid of p-values. And then it was the so what question, what happens next, right? So even there, if the idea is to do something better than a p-value, well, you better have a pretty good understanding of what a p-value is so you can understand how to replace that. Now, if you are feeling at all self-conscious about maybe you don't understand, maybe you're starting to question, maybe you thought you know what p-values were, but Darren says nobody knows what they are. Um, I'm gonna put you in some very good company. Does anybody know who Hannah Fry is? I see a few head nods, right? If there's such thing as like a famous numbers person, Hannah Fry, right, is at the, you know, apex, top of the food chain. She's objectively brilliant, objectively good at explaining quantitative things, things around numbers and all the rest of it. And she wrote this fantastic, among many other fantastic things she's done, she wrote this great thing in the New Yorker down a few years ago, five years ago. And what statistics can and can't tell us about ourselves. Anyway, you should go and read this, but what was maybe you know, as a side point interesting about it is it came with this correction eventually that in the paper, in the New Yorker, one of the world's most popular publications written by one of the world's foremost experts on communicating statistics and numbers and all the rest of it, they got the definition of a p-value wrong. So if you don't feel like you understand what a p-value is, again, I promise you're in good company. And that earlier... Uh, thing in nature about the psychology journals banning p-values. Again, they incorrectly defined a p-value in the article about the journal that banned having p-values because people don't understand p-values. You can laugh at that. I, I, I think it's hilarious. I think, I, I think it's very funny. Like, we just fundamentally don't understand this. So I know we're kind of a mixed audience. So what I'll do is I won't linger here long. 
but I suppose if I've said this many things about p-values, I should at least say something to the effect of what a p-value is. And I think that we have a real problem in that we're always trying to oversimplify what p-values are when we're teaching. We're always trying to drive people, or it feels to me anyway, like if you don't have like a one sentence definition of what a p-value is and somehow you don't understand it. Well, I don't have a one sentence definition for anything that works in my car, whether it's the you know, the, the, the washer pump or the, the carburetor or anything else. Do cars even have carburetors anymore? I think they do. Anyway, we have this kind of thing where we're always trying to simplify the stats. We have to simplify everything. We have to simplify it. Well, some things maybe just can't be simplified, or maybe they shouldn't be. But the simplest way I can think about a p-value is it's really a statement about discordance between data we observe and some hypothesis or proposition we have about the world. Right. And so what we might start with is what statisticians love is just a coin. And so you imagine I standing in front of you and I have a coin in my hand and I tell you that the coin is fair. And the task for us is to try to find some way to evaluate whether you think the coin is actually fair. Right. So the obvious thing we would do is start flipping the coin. Show me some actual evidence, you know, and then we'll make some kind of a guess about that. Now, I've got the coin in my hand. It's not actually a coin in my hand. I've got the coin in my hand. And I flip it, and I can never remember. I've been here 11 years. Is that a tail or a head, or we just go with heart? What's the cultural norm? The cultural norm is just heart. Thank you very much. So I flip a heart. All right. Is the coin fair or not? Shout out. Don't be bashful. <laughs> we don't know, right? It's not enough information. We don't know if the coin is fair. So I flip it again. I've got two harps in a row. Is the coin fair? Life or death? No, like no, like that's not that unusual, right? If the coin was fair, it wouldn't be surprising to see two harps in a row. If we got to three, anybody feeling a little? We getting three? I feel some nervousness in the room. What's he gonna do? Four in a row? Uh, are we, are we, could we feel certain either way? Not certain either way, right? But maybe we're starting to feel. Sorry? It's worth the punt. It's maybe we're worth the punt. It, again, important, you know, it depends on the cost of a wrong and a right. You know, if you were to make a declaration now, um, five in a row. Does anybody want to at that point say, oh, coin's not fair? Five, I mean, okay. I'll let you off the hook. I don't know if the coin's fair. There's not a coin. I don't know if it's fair enough. So what did we just do, right? We have a proposition. I have a coin, the coin is fair. That's the universe. And we're starting off from a position of this is what's true, right? If that's true, these are the probabilities for these different results, right? The probability if the coin is fair of getting four harps in a row uh, is, is 0 0.063, uh, five in a row is 0 0.032. Uh, 0 0.05, our famous, famous, famous criterion is right in the middle there. So when people want to declare significance, and, and I've seen lectures before that say that it's kind of a, a, an old tale, that the 0 0.05 comes from the fact that that's where you start to feel a little ambivalent about whether the coin is fair or not. Does anybody know where the 0 0.05 comes from? that we all use in every paper, every paper, 0 0.05 is our level of statistical significance. This is one of my favorite things ever. This is from Fisher. Fisher is obviously a, a you know, prominent statistician from the early 20th century. Where 0 0.05 comes from is basically Fisher saying, seems about right to me. <laughs> so Fisher was a geneticist and the plant uh, experimentalist. And so he viewed p-values as almost like a filter. If he could fail to produce significant values, um, then he knew he was off on a, the wrong path. If he could consistently produce significant values with his significant experiments, and he felt that he was onto something. But he basically just said, look, he uses one in 25%, but if you want, call it one in 50, call it one in 100. I personally go with one in 20. The influence of Fisher is this in part, right? We've all been using 0.05 ever since. And this issue is kind of us as me included, as like thoughtless trapped or trapped, you know, carriers of statistical practice going forward. Um, 
just accepting this and doing it is a really, I think, indicative part of our kind of dysfunction with statistics in some ways, right? And this is why we start getting articles about how we should ban statistics and all that sort of Now, if we were just to do a probability distribution function of what we were doing, uh, this is just showing the exact same thing. So if we were out of an experiment where we flip a coin five times, we'd see zero harps, you know, 3.2% of the time and five harps, 3.2% of the time. Most of the time we get two or we get three, right? There's nothing in that number that says for sure whether the coin is fair. It's just telling us a discordance about our data here. In our example, we got out to here, but certainly not impossible to see five, but it also points to the value of sample and replication. And so that's our experiment with five flips of the coin. If we instead plotted these as proportions of, of, of harps out of the total number of coin flips, that's where we got to the last time, five out of five, 100%. But if we did that 10 times, it looked at the proportion, ah, the green bar almost goes away, more extreme values start to become less and less probable, given that the coin is fair, we go out to 20, we go out to 100, and we'd almost never see anything even approaching 80% of harps, you know, in terms of this. So this is why we always want a big sample size, to make those extreme examples more and more rare. But the point is that this distribution, these sampling distributions, these probability distributions under the idea and the assumption that the data are generated one day under some hypothesis, this is the core idea underlying p-values that we don't often teach people. But that is the starting point. So then what are p-values, what I said before, essentially a measure of incompatibility between some data or test statistic or an estimate, something we've actually observed, and then some premise about how the world is, what we might call a null model. And all the p-value is, is a discordance between those two things. We don't want to over uh, interpret what they are. And then from a logical perspective, they operate under this thing called modus tollens, denying the consequence. And so that's a logical proposition that says, if A, then B, not B, then not A. And so if we translate this into what we're talking about, if my null is true, then the data should look like this, that sampling distribution, right? But the data don't look like this because I got 10 parts in a row, right? Which would be very, very unusual if the data were, if it was a fair coin. And thus I might conclude that the null is false. But again, never with absolute certainty. So then how do we use these p-values? And I once queried the world, Twitter, uh, and Deborah Mayo, who is a philosopher of statistics. Who knew that there were philosophers of statistics? Anybody? There are philosophers of statistics. They'll stick their nose into anything, I swear. And Deborah Mayo is very good, though. And sorry, that kind of implies that other philosophers of statistics aren't. I'm sure they're all great. Uh, but Deborah Mayo is great. And so she comes back with this idea, use to block spurious effects and fooling yourself. And essentially the way I've come to view p-values is, is certainly that they are essentially a defense against someone making a claim. If someone comes to me, so if I work in clinical trials, which I do, and someone comes to me and they said, Darren, I've got a pill. The pill does amazing things. All right, prove it. You've made a claim. And my starting point against for that claim is that it doesn't do anything. And I've been involved in enough trials to know that most things don't actually work. And that's the real truth of it. And so we start from that premise. Now, if you can show me data that if the pill doesn't do anything, right, that would surprise me, then I might start to listen to you. So it's just, it's, at the end of the day, it's just a way of just kind of probing claims uh, and, and, and making sure that we're not jumping uh, over interpreting data uh, way too quickly. So... All of the stuff I talked about before with the journal banning p-values and articles in nature and what's going on with p-values um, led to now many years ago, actually, um, the American Statistical Association um, releasing a, a, essentially putting together this blue ribbon panel of statisticians and philosophers and all the rest of it to come together and say something about, well, what are we gonna do about p-values? We've got journals. We're starting to just not use them at all. That's not going very well. What are we going to do? And in this process of doing this, you brought in a lot, they brought in a lot of people who like hated p-values to their very core. They thought that philosophically and on principles that they were a completely broken tool, 
lots of other people in the same um, kind of group who were trying, trying to put this document together, who were very much still fans of them and thought they were very useful and all the rest of it. And they tried to essentially produce some kind of a statement. And this was either the first or maybe the second time that the American Statistical Association had ever come out with a position statement on anything, despite the fact that one of their core roles is to kind of comment on the role of statistics and data and how policymakers use it and all the rest of it. So they did come up with a statement. And what I thought I would do is I'd just go through a few of the key things that they brought out for anybody who's interested, and then we'll finish on big picture stuff. And probably the biggest one is that people get wrong. So if we go back to that survey at the beginning, so this is the part where you now, for the rest of your life, you get to aha people, right? Being an applied statistician is getting to be smug about things you just learned that other people haven't quite learned yet, right? This is really the role of an applied statistician. So now you'll know this if you didn't know it already. But what people get wrong about p-values is they say that, ah, the p-value is the probability that the null is true. This is what people say over and over again. Now, what's wrong about that statement? When we calculated the p-value, we are assuming the null is true. There's no probability that the null is true because the very existence of the p-value is it's a comparison of the data we observe to a sampling distribution assuming the null is true. We're saying if the null is true, that's a p-value. Right, so it doesn't measure the probability that the hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. We're essentially assuming the data are produced by random chance alone and then comparing what we see to that assumption. The hypothesis is a given. This is the important thing. If you were to go to YouTube, at least a few years ago now, uh, again, time keeps moving. Five years ago is like yesterday. And you were to look up, you know, Google p-value, the most popular video at the time uh, explaining what p-values were, this was their explanation. A p-value is the probability that random chance generated the data or something else that is equal to, like this mush math of words. Now, all due respect to the person who produced this, they produced a lot of really nice videos, and they probably had more positive influence on people in statistics than I'll ever have, right? They have videos with millions of views. But again, even if these people can get it wrong, you know, what hope for the rest of us? But they shouldn't have got this wrong. Yeah, it's, it, you see this over and over and over again. Um, this is kind of more obvious stuff about p-values. And these three points are all kind of very similar, which is just to say that a p-value is just one piece of information, right? We are scientists who have a question. We have generated a study that in turn will generate some data that we can use to say something sensible about that question. And the p-value is one bit of that, right? It doesn't tell us that the effect we've determined is there is big or small necessarily. Uh, it might give some kind of clue to that. Um, it, it isn't the end-all be-all for a scientific conclusion. Uh, and but we'll come back to this in a minute, but we often treat it that way, right? We have lots of ways, and as Sean kind of alluded to or said at the beginning, where we do seem to be treating p-values like they're the arbiter of, oh, that is worth sharing, that is true, uh, if not, that is false, and so on. Um, again, following from, from some of the stuff Sean was saying as well, to understand and to use p-values, it's really important that we're transparent and clear about everything in the step that led up to that p-value, right? Ultimately, a p-value is about this idea, again, of a sampling distribution. It's the idea that we have some data generating mechanism, we imagine that we could rerun that mechanism an infinite number of times, hypothetically. Each time, it's going to produce some kind of different value, right? If I were to take everyone in this room, and I split you at random into two groups, and I measured all your blood pressures, and I got a mean of blood pressure in this group and a mean of blood pressure in that group, and I took the difference, that's a value, right? That's a result. If I did that again, that's my data generating mechanism. If I did that again, if I re-randomized all of you, would I get the exact same result? No, right? You'd wind up in different groups. I'd meet your mean blood pressure in each group. I'd take the difference. It'd be a little different. You imagine doing that an infinite number of times. It gives you the sampling distribution of what those mean differences of blood pressure are. You have to know what that data generating mechanism is. And so some of the ways that we get it wrong are some of the things that point, Sean pointed out. Uh, we, you know, ideas around multiple testing. So everybody's probably seen this by this point, this XKCD cartoon, jelly beans cause acne, uh, but non-significant. 
No, that settles that. Ah, wait, and we're good at this. We are so good at this, especially in medicine. I hear it's only a certain color. Right now we're changing, we're moving the goalposts, right? And so what do they do? So we've got a non-significant result. We can't publish this in JAMA. Uh, now well, we've got to check all the colors. And so uh, great, no, purple, no, brown, no, turquoise, no. And oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We found a link. It's green jelly beans and acne. P less than 0.05, everybody's happy, right? This is a cartoon. This is what people do all the time. Right. If your data generated mechanism was do all the different colors and select the one that has this criterion, your p-value criterion would be something very different if that was how you were actually making decisions. Another one, and there's our, and this isn't, it's actually not fair. This shouldn't say news. This should say university press office, because uh, that's actually where most of this stuff starts. It starts within our own. Um, people have now turned to doing a lot of replication. Uh, studies, like if we take a bunch of studies here, uh, this is a, a distribution plot of p-values, and this is 0 0.05, and so they took a bunch of studies, right, that all had significant results, right, so that's why all that distribution is crammed below 0 0.05. All these studies, significant results, except of a few. They replicated those studies, and that's the distribution of p-values in the replications, right? Much wider spread, relatively few under 0.05, yeah, like this is the stuff that happens now regularly and the emergence of the field of meta science and all the rest of it to hopefully keep ourselves all a little bit more honest. This one's a little near and dear unto me. This is on the issue of outcome selection. You know, there's again, if your laser focuses on p values and you're not paying attention to what else is going on, there's lots of things we can tweak and twist about a study, you know, to gain more favorable results. Maybe if we're not even being nefarious. Sometimes we're being nefarious. Um, so this is the results of uh, studies and in, 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 in diet. And, and, and these are published before uh, rules came into place for clinical trials about making people um, select their primary outcome and register it and make that clear and transparent for people. So in other words, people were running studies, they'd measure 20 different outcomes, and they say, ah, it's the, it's the pink jelly bean. They say, ah, like... It was, the, it was the quality of life measure that was significant. That goes in the abstract, that goes in the conclusion, everything else. So these are those results, the ones that were reported. And these are all reporting relative risks below one, which in this case meant that whatever they were testing treatment was beneficial, right? So this is the way it used to be. This is where 2000, where we start making people register their primary outcomes on clinicaltrials.gov, the ones and all the rest of it. And lo and behold, these are what the results start to look like right after, right? So if we're just focusing on p-values, this is the kind of stuff we're hiding. So a bunch of results all now very close to one. Nothing ever works, which is my experience. Nothing ever works. All right, this one's just a bit of a bugaboo. Uh, I'm almost there. Make two minutes into my time, so I'm picking it back. <laughs> Sorry, Vincent, but I'll, 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 I'll work right through. This is a bugaboo. We see this all the time. Um, people are so desperate to get that significant result. Uh, we got a P of 0 0.06. The lengths that people will go through to like cast that as a positive result, and clinicians in particular, oh my lord, uh, a decreasing trend, a definite trend, a favorable trend. This is from a blog post uh, written by a guy named Matt Hankins, and he went through and just found all these. Like I mean, he has like hundreds of these examples. A marked trend, a marginal trend, you know, a margin at the edge of significance, 0 0.0608. The, they P values don't trend. They don't move. It's what you got is what you got, right? And what's important to understand about P values is under a null, when the, when the null is true, any P value is equally likely. A 0.09, or 0.9, they're the same probability if the null is true, right? They're, they're really, they're completely random uh, on a uniform random uh, probability. Uh, so this idea that they trend is very false. And Stephen Sin, who's a very well-known uh, clinical trial statistician, uh, he has the winning argument of all time, and I've used this myself. If 0.06 is a trend towards significance, does 0.04 reflect a trend towards non-significance? And those are the few arguments that I win. It's just done. It's, the debate is over, and we take that language out of the paper. Everyone's um, And there are papers about this, and I'll just skip past that, but that's the thing that people can simulate and all the rest of it. All right, so to finish now, the root 
kind of problems, uh, I think, that, that we're really getting into. And this is a quote from David Spiegelhalter. Again, if there's such a thing as a famous statistician, he's one of them. Um, and he worked a lot in medicine. And he talks this story of you know being confronted by a doctor at 4 p.m. Could you just T and P the data by Monday? So do a, do a T test, get a P value, and get it back to me like that, right? That is toxic and dysfunction. Like medical research where could you just T and P the data for me? And that is not an unusual state of affairs, right? So we have to get people to engage with this as an idea that they have to start to be responsible for the statistics. They, if you're going to be a scientist and you're using p-values, you need to know. Now, the thing I always go to is, I think, what is the greatest paper ever written in medical research. And this was published in the BMJ in 1994. It's written by Doug Altman. It's a three-paragraph letter, essentially, that makes the point that if we were doing surgery using poor methods, it would be a scandal. And the name of the paper is The Scandal of Medical Research. But we're doing scientific studies that guide how surgery is conducted, but we're doing those studies without appropriate methods. And what Altman does, probably well ahead of a lot of his predecessors who talk about this now, is he got right to the incentive, the publication incentive, the, you know, the incentive to produce significant results, the incentive to further our own careers, and make that much more important than actually improving population lives and all the rest of it. And ultimately he came down to a conclusion that none of us want to walk into, you know, a, a Dean of Research's office and just say the simple thing that we should all know, which is we need a lot less research, right? We need to do less research better. It's the answer from a research integrity perspective. But I know working with, you know, a lot of really wonderful clinician investigators that the it's constraints on them, essentially, this is their model. You know, I've got some data, I'm going to put it into Excel. I've, somebody's got a copy of SPSS somewhere on their computer uh, that was left over from 10 years ago. I'm going to get a stats decision tree that's going to tell me what test to use. And I'm going to do all of this at midnight because I just did a locum and I've just been working my off as a clinician. You know, that's the kind of model we use now as I get well up onto my high horse. It's not just about statistics, and we've talked about this before. We can get statistics wrong, but also how the data are processed, how it's managed, and all the rest of it. That goes hand in hand with these issues, how we don't take this stuff seriously enough. It leads to an awful lot of research waste. So this is something I would point people to. This is now a bit dated, um, but this was a special series in The Lancet from several years ago on research waste. It's the basic idea that we're producing all this research, we're paying for all this research, but at the end of the day, if we're talking about impact on decision makers, it's either that we're using questions that aren't that important to people. When we do produce the research, we might not have access to a publication or the report of that research. If we do have access to that research, it might not be reported very well, so it might as well not be accessible to us, but also that we're not using appropriate design and methods, and that includes statistics. And statistics is study design, and study design is statistics. So they're the same thing. That led to these quotes, which I find very telling. Um, this was Marcia Angel, who was the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is Richard Horton, still editor of The Lancet. Both of them basically declaring, I don't think I can believe most biomedical research. And a lot of that has to do with invalidatory, uh, invalid exploratory analyses, um, you know, small sample sizes, tiny effects, you know, things that are misunderstandings of statistics at the design stage leading to these situations. And when you consider the, 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 the reality that these journals have played in creating this environment where we're supposed to be high impact journals and publishing all the time, like these people are guilty of contributing to the problems in some ways. And even they can step back and say, look, like I don't trust most of this. And a lot of it has to do with stats. All right, the literal last, last thing, where do you go? Well, I'll highlight a few things. You go locally. If you have the support available to you locally, and that support is someone's crazy enough to raise their hand and say, I'll help people with their stats and their study design, you go and you take advantage of that, right? But we also have to be our learners. We have to kind of engage with stats ourselves. So a great book is this one. You don't have to be a psychologist. It's Understanding Psychology as a Science 
it talks about the kind of philosophy of statistics. What do we really do with p-values? How does this fit with Bayesian ideas and all the rest of it? So that's a great book for an introduction to those things. Um, I really like this website, Daniel Lakins. He's another psychologist, but he's put a lot of effort uh, into basic statistic ideas around p-values, error control, and things like that. Um, if you're in medical research, um, you can find the whole series of what were called statistics notes in the British Medical Journal. Those were written by Doug Altman and Martin Bland. And there's a whole series, there's like 50 of them, and they're all like less than two pages of just basic things about basic stats that most of us really need to know written in a really accessible way. And then finally, finally, this is another book called Statistical Re Rethinking. Uh, it's written by an anthropologist. A lot of great statisticians are not statisticians, right? They kind of came to it by struggling with the stats and they want to teach people. Um, and this is a book called Statistical Rethinking, which is all about Bayesian statistics, if you're kind of curious about that. And he's got videos and all the rest of it. All right, with that, I'll shut up and I'll get out of the way for a bit. So thank you. Thanks very much, Darren. Look, we're just while we set up here, maybe we'll take one question. Yeah, if anyone wants to pounce, and then we'll uh, let Vincent start, and then at the end, we'll uh, have open up the floor to other questions. If, so, does any any question for Darren? I don't do math in front of people. That's <laughs> Anyone want to pounce? So if not P, then what? Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> Another two hour lecture. <laughs> no, no, one minute. Yeah. I can ask something. Please. How do you know that if you're reviewing papers, so we all review papers yep. and, up, and you see this nonsense about trending towards significance and you just call it out time and time and time again? Yeah, you, you do, basically. And, and I've written a little bit about this. Um, it, it it becomes very disheartening because a lot of these statistical misconceptions are so ingrained and it's not that they're just out there, they're out there and they're propagated by experts and people who have, you know, 10 trials in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, who have used this language 10 times in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you're the statistician from Cork saying, you know, you shouldn't say this and here's 10 references, but it, they don't want to hear it. And so it does become a bit of a dispiriting battle, you know. So again, it's another point of, you know, you work locally, you improve locally, you improve yourself, and you fight that fight as much as you can, but there are limits to it for sure. You're fighting an uphill battle. You've called out yourself from reviewers if you don't use it, mm -hmm. if you don't at least p-values continually or even for statistics, and when there is no need for a statistic for what you're saying, we can often get called out even at conferences. Why are there no p-values over your poster? Yeah. You know, no, we get that without p value. We get that all the time. And trying to explain it to people can be very, very frustrating. There you go. So thanks, thanks very much again, Darren, for that. And we might come back with questions at the end. Moving on to the second part, <clears throat> excuse me, second part of this session here, which is uh, Dr. Vincent Cregan uh, doing a demonstration on the or giving an overview on the resources created around statistical analysis planning. So maybe just to introduce uh, Vincent to anyone that's not familiar, maybe here in the room or online. So Vincent is a lecturer in the Department of Mathematics on the MTU uh, core campuses. He's the course coordinator for our Master's in Data Science and Analytics, and he's the national lead of the statistical component of the professional diploma for maths, uh, of maths for teachers as well. Vincent, over to you. Thank you, Sean. And I'd like to say first, thanks, Sean, for getting me involved in this. It's uh, been a fun project to work on, and thanks, Lydia and um, Roshi as well for helping in the background. Okay, so I'm going to give you an overview of this course today. Uh, first of all, I'll just give the aim of this. The whole idea of this course is to give people who maybe don't have a strong background in statistics kind of the key things they need to think about when they're putting together uh, a research study, okay? At the heart of each research study, there'll be at least one research question. And I put something in topical for myself at the moment uh, with this newborn. Ours is uh, not as distressed as this poor guy, but um, this there's lots of studies and or research studies involving newborns. Here's one in particular, I don't have a specific paper, but checking if the inclusion of white noise in a room when a baby's trying to sleep, does it help their sleep cycles? I don't know, we haven't tried this yet. But um, yeah, so how would this work? You could have two populations, a population of newborns, um, exposed to white noise, population not exposed to white noise, take some samples from each population and measure their average sleeping time. Um, and then you do your statistical test at the end, okay? One that may be more, we are all kind of aware during COVID-19, we were bombarded with news in relation to trials. 
And all these clinical trials would have had some of some some of the aspects of this course that we're proposing here. And this one in particular, they're looking at um, preventing severe disease with a placebo group and a, a non-placebo group. Okay, so there's lots of different types of research studies, health-related, education. There's lots of types. In fact, you can get nearly get a research study for any type. This isn't one I made up. I don't have the particular paper, but there's a 2015 paper that has over 250 citations. I'm looking at does watching cat videos help you or does it boost, pro boost, boost productivity? And I think in that uh, particular paper, there was a sample of 7,000 people. They were interviewed or asked about their work and internet behavior. And it, the results that came out, something they, they, they show that yes, watching videos like maybe not like this, but it can help uh, productivity. And it also looked at the guilt associated with watching videos while you were supposed to be working. Okay, so again, this study would have used the tools that we're going to discuss in a moment. So yeah, they can be used in lots of different scenarios. So you see this if you look at the slides in the course we have here, indicative scientific method steps. Indicative is important there because this course isn't the be all and end all, but what it does give you, it gives you a good starting point, a good set of guidelines that you can use if you're doing a research study, okay? So, I'm gonna go through this, each of these. Each of these sections as I go along the screen, they represent a topic that we have in the course, okay? So the first thing you need to think about when you're putting it together, you have your research question in mind, you come up with a type of study, okay? So in that first topic, we look at different types of studies that are available to you. Are you getting data from the past? That's already there. Are you collecting data at one point? Are you getting it into the future at various points? Okay, and talk about some of the advantages, disadvantages, and highlight some scenarios where each could be used. Once you've decided on the type of study you're gonna use, you're gonna to need to think about how you're gonna collect the data. So we look at some non-probability sampling methods, and some probability-based sampling methods and highlighting how bias can be introduced if you maybe sample in not the best way. Okay, so once you've got your data in place, you're going to start doing some, well, first of all, you actually have to categorize the data because it's very important. The type of data that you have is going to influence the type of analysis you do and then ultimately the type of testing you do. When you have your data in place in your Excel file or wherever, use some exploration, you're going to generate some nice graphs, Come up with some summary statistics and again the type of data is going to influence what's going to happen here this section is broken up into two uh, topics in the course first one is on when you're dealing with a single variable and then we have a second topic where you're dealing with two or more variables okay and finally these last this last section is, and this is probably the kind of big part of the course the hypothesis testing or statistical testing that's broken up into two sections. We first of all kind of do kind of a general description. So there is some discussion of p-values, not as good as what we had to say, but there's still there's some, we don't get into it too technically. The idea again here is we're kind of giving you an overview of everything, and then you can kind of go off with these words to the appropriate place to get more information. You know, okay. So we do the theory of statistical testing or hypothesis testing. And then in that as well, we also have these trees that say, all right, you have this type of data, you go this way, you go this way. You've got one variable or two variables that's going to dictate which you go. So it gives you an idea on where you should be going and what tests you should be doing. And that gives you to your, leads you to your conclusion. So you can tell if watching cat videos helps with your work or not, okay? In terms of the resources that are available, I've already mentioned the first one. There are seven recordings in the course and seven sets of slides associated with them. Okay, I've also put in some supplementary recordings and I may add more to these as I go along. Just some extra things here and there just to like if I I, I even recorded some yesterday, I, I had some more ideas. Just if I give you a particular research question, I go through it on how would you define the hypothesis test for it, which test is appropriate, and being clear on the difference, difference between a population and a sample. Okay, there's different types of quizzes on there, there's some multiple choice quizzes. Each section, not each, most sections have a quiz in there, whether it's a categorization quiz or a multiple choice quiz, just testing to see if you understand. Um, the concept discussed, okay? There's also discussions in there. Each topic has a discussion. So myself or Sean have access to the module. If questions are posed, we can answer them. Learners can answer questions as well. And there's a general discussion in there as well for just the whole course in total. And then some supplementary material um, resources that kind of, all right, you have the material in the course, but if you want to get deeper into it, we have suggest some software that you can use, websites and books as well, of course, okay?
Now, the last part is this optional assessment. If you go through all the material, and you can go through this in any order you like, of course, you should start at the top and work down. But once you go through it, there is this optional assessment that you can do, which will give you a badge for the course. Okay, just to, just to kind of highlight that you've gone through this and you know you've earned this um, badge. Okay, I think it's twelve out of fifteen multiple choice questions you have to get right. So it's not too taxing, and you can do it as many times as you like. So you get through it. It's like the cyber security things. You'll get through it a few. <laughs> Okay, so I say here I'll finish with questions, but maybe I'll jump over first and actually go through the actual um, the demo. So let me see if I can do this correctly. So I mean, I should have mentioned that all of this is on Canvas. Okay, so anyone here in MTU would be very familiar with this, but if you're not familiar with Canvas, it's fairly self-explanatory. Just work your way down through the various topics. The course introduction, very similar to what I've talked about today, um, similar enough. And then you go down through You've got the types of studies and sampling. So you can see there what's involved. You get the recording, which I think links into YouTube and is public now, I think. Yeah. yeah. So we, we're kind of making it available to people beyond uh, MTU. Okay. With the lecture slides. Okay. And then here, yeah, an interactive task. I can't remember what I did. I did something. Oh, yeah, I know. I give a description where I'm asking you to pick out what the sample is because, you know, I just from experience, I can see still students mix up what the sample is, what a statistic is, what a population is, what a parameter is, okay? Then you've got an MCQ quiz. Again, and you don't have to do these. They're just there to help with the uh, final uh, assessment if you want. And then there's a discussion where if you're not clear on anything or if you uh, want help with anything in that first section, you can ask, put a question there. I'll answer for Sean, I'll answer, or another learner will answer. It's very similar after that then. You've got your second topic, third topic, different types of quizzes, different types of videos in there, and you work your way down to the big one. For it finish, I didn't put too much in, in topic seven because it's actually the longest lecture. I think it's nearly 25 minutes. Yeah, most of the lectures are 10 to 15 minutes. They're not too long because we don't want you to have the other things to be doing with your time. But we, the last one I did put a bit longer in because it, it's kind of really the meat of the whole uh, course. Okay. Then just the optional assessment, 12 out of 15 multiple choice questions. And I double check this, they're all working. And finally, then you've got your list of supplementary material. I won't click into any of this, um, just as it all works. But uh, um, if there's any issues, you can let us know. And then there's a discussion here on the left hand side as well. That's where the general discussion is. Okay, so again, any questions about the course in general or what you're trying to do, we can help if we can. Okay, any questions on that? That's kind of it. Um, any questions? Just I want to share one other slide there, but maybe just while I'm getting that there, there, does any questions for Vincent on the resources? One thing I think, Sean, this is yep. live now, so people can register if they want to do it. Maybe that's is that what you're going to mention. No, uh, no, not yet. Okay. But, yeah, I don't know how that works. So, yeah, yes, there, but there's a, I guess, for, there's a QR code as well for people that are not into you. Yeah, can pull squads can do it as well, can they? Oh, yeah, yeah, think, yeah, yeah, it's, it's built for everyone, yeah. Asynchronous so people can start next year, like it would be kind of like it's going to be spread forever. Right. And yeah, I, like I'll probably, like at time, I'll probably even do updates because it's just, I think, like yes, I said, all right, so I was looking at one section, I think it does a bit more work. But so just, just to highlight, because it just touches on the question there, because I do know that there are uh, participants uh, online as well that actually are not very proud of MTU, which is actually great to see that there was that interest in this. The resources that Vincent has created are openly available. We have uh, on the Center for Open Science, we have all the slides that uh, Vincent has created available there, and there's links then to the YouTube channel as well. So here there's a QR code for those resources if anyone's interested. The slide deck of this presentation will be shared afterwards, and obviously everything's going to be up on YouTube, so uh, there is access to this, so it's not that people have to take uh, shots here, but I suppose it's very important for us that when we do create these resources that they are openly available, and obviously that aligns with Target 16, Goal 10 uh, in um, the sustainable development goals as well. But then that's, that's equally the case for other resources that we've created across the university in research ethics application process. Again, all QR codes there, these resources being openly available. Uh, we have resources around fostering research integrity, responsible dissemination, research data management, all openly available. Again, if there's the QR code to access. The reason there's badges here and the same for the statistical analysis plan is if people want to do the digital badge, but that's not a requirement. First and foremost for us, it's, it's a repository of resources that are there to help support people, I suppose, in their responsible conduct of research. 
But if they want to go a step forward and be formally recognized, there is the badge. But it's not a requirement, and Vincent would have mentioned the same uh, in his own presentation as well. And just another resource that we have is a uh, Cori uh, recent project, which has a lot of nice resources on research integrity and research ethics as well. And again, the QR code is there for all that as well. Okay. Uh, and just any uh, questions now for around five minutes, maybe a bit less. If, if there's any questions, maybe for Vincent or Darren or myself. Anything anyone wants to share? Everyone happy enough? I'm happy. Brilliant. For I'm really happy. Brilliant. And those, those uh, I suppose, uh, from uh, M2, that email would be shared around, uh, you sent probably tomorrow with a link to uh, all this, the slides and obviously with this recording. And those online uh, that may not be part of M2, there, we have a YouTube channel, Research Integrity, on, uh, sorry, RI underscore MTU, and this recording will be up on that, and all access to everything will be available there as well. Okay, so look, if there's no questions, I suppose my thing, last thing then was just a couple of thank yous, and I won't keep you long, but obviously an event like this doesn't just happen. There are obviously, there's a lot of work happens behind the scenes. First, thank yous to Owen Cameron, the technician involved in the School of uh, Building and Civil Engineering, helped us uh, setting up uh, yesterday. We did a dry run of this. The dry one did work well. Obviously, a few technical glitches here, but we adapted. Thank very much thanks to the School of Building and Civil Engineering for allowing us to use this room. This isn't just openly available for everyone, but so it was very uh, much appreciated that they allowed us to have this hybrid event here. Thanks to Lydia, Biscop of Flaherty, who works with me in the area of research and technology compliance. Uh, a lot of work, I mean, uh, logistics happens behind the scenes. Lydia is nearly has the, the checklist. Look, have, have we done this? Have I done this? Have I contacted this person? So it really keeps it uh, going. So thanks very much for that. To Darren and uh, Vincent, uh, thanks very much. Uh, first to Darren, I suppose I asked Darren to come here, and it's, it's obviously very much in a voluntary capacity. Look, do you mind giving us a talk? But there's kind of a work there then to that, like there's homework now for Darren to prepare for. So look, thanks very much for giving up your time to actually present here. It's such an interesting talk as well, and such a useful topic. And I think a topic that would be useful for our research community uh, as well. And then obviously to Vincent Cregan uh, for the work in developing the resources. We started working on this, I think maybe six months ago, a lot of meetings uh, over and back and different things. And it, it, it's great to see it come to fruition in, in, in this meeting here today as well. And um, thanks to yourselves, both here physically in the room and participants on the line. Obviously it's great when we have an event that we actually uh, have a launch of resources that there's people to actually do the, uh, to launch them with. So very much thanks to everyone for giving up their time. It's uh, an over approaching the summer and it was nice that people could support this. Uh, it's not a quite time. I don't think we have quite time anymore in academia. So look, thank you, thank you very much for, for the support. And that's it. All the best.